Hello and welcome to the Two Man Power Trip of Wrestling. I'm your host, JP John Pazway, with a very special guest. You may know him as Beautiful or Billy, Billy Wiles, but of course we know him as Bilvis Wesley, a.k.a. William Wiles, former ECW superstar. Welcome to the Two Man Power Trip. How are you doing? Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. What's going on in your world? What have you been up to? Um, I, I really uh, I just stay busy working. I got uh, like two straight jobs. My wife and I run a, um, a, a travel business. I do a travel vlog on YouTube. I just started and uh, just staying busy trying to travel as much as possible. So anything wrestling related or no? I, I kind of stepped away from wrestling right before the uh, pandemic in uh, 2019. My uh, I was coaching at the Monster Factory and uh, <clears throat> my schedule and, you know, and things like that. I was only being able to get there once a week. And, um, and then my body really, I have a lot of really bad back problems. Um, in fact, I have another appointment, uh, next Tuesday, uh, to, you know, go see my, my spine guy and, uh, I'm losing feeling in my, my legs and my feet and things like that. And, uh, they're like, just, you have to stay away from that. So <clears throat> I kind of stepped away from, from wrestling. I still talk to some, you know, some of the guys I, I coached and things like that, but, uh, I, I've really stepped away from it. Kind of dangerous, right? I mean, if you get the, the back injury going on, you, you can't feel your you know your feet and your legs. That's not good. Yeah, well, um, I, I just went for this test where they stick these electrodes <laughs> in your back, and um, you know they run electricity down to your feet and things like that. Sorry about that. And um, <clears throat> they see you know, you know where you know the signals are being blocked through your nerves. And I've had acupuncture before. I'm like, oh, they're just you know these little needles, no big deal. But that was some painful. Could we curse on here? Sure. Okay, that's some painful shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, there's digging around with needles, trying to find nerves and stuff like that. So those test results came back. I have to go back to my spine guy. And there, there is some, some, uh, some issues. So that's what's being worked on right now. Damn, and is that just from years of wrestling and, and kind of a, maybe abusing your body a little bit and hurting the back? Yeah, prob probably. They're trying to figure out, you know, is it is it the trauma? Is it uh, there's something that can be, you know, fixed, you know, chiropractically and things like that. But they're just trying to figure out that now. I mean, I, I wrestled 10 years amateur wrestling, you know, and all these years of pro wrestling. It, I probably It's probably, you know, because of that. <laughs> gotta be yeah it definitely can't be good not natural or not normal i guess to be taking those kind of bumps forever yeah no no so it is what it is but uh yeah i'm, I'm happy i mean i i wrestling to me was never uh in my, my whole life you know it was uh, i was always been a performer I, I grew up i was a drummer i was in a band torn in a band before i ever got to pro wrestling so it was just another you know avenue of performing for me um, and, uh, so, you know, I miss it, uh, but it's, it's not as devastating as, you know, you would think. What kind of music was it? I, I play, I've played every kind of music. Um, I mean, I grew up of course playing in the hardcore bands, heavy metal bands. Um, I actually, at 16, I was playing with my, um, music theory teachers, um, jazz band, oh. uh, right out there in, in Belmore, New Jersey at, uh. At a club, it's probably not there. It's called Jason's. It was a jazz club, uh, so I'm, I'm sitting in with some of these like heavy duty jazz guys. <laughs> um, but yeah, playing in um, the, I, I was in a nine piece funk band, touring, you know, uh, with a horn line and percussionists and all that stuff. Um, before I moved here, I was playing with um, uh, oldies. I was backing up all the oldies acts um, in, uh, in like Atlantic City and, and stuff like that. Any bands we would know, like the names of, as far as uh, you being in? <clears throat> um, I mean, if you, unless you were from Jersey, the the biggest band that was in from there was Copious Jive. We were a, a funk band. We toured with um, we you know Blind Melon, um, bands like that. Um, wow, I, I was recently Melon. I was recently playing with Eddie Testa, um, Eddie and the Cruisers, um, uh, before I moved here. So I moved here in 07, so I was his drummer for a while. And then Joey Arminio and the family, that was the oldies act. Uh, we were backing up all the oldies guys. I mean, you know, all, all those guys that came through, we backed them up. 
well, what a range there. Funk and jazz and rock and Eddie and the cruisers <laughs> and blah, you know, uh, the group with, uh, that was playing before blind melon. I mean, that's quite a, uh, a range there. You got. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> growing up, they used to call me the garbage man. Cause I would play with any band that asked me and no matter how good they were or how bad they were. I was, I, you know, back then I was playing with four or five bands gigging six nights a week. I mean, that's how I, I, I got good. I believe. Uh, just playing in different bands, playing with Ario Speedwagon cover band, and then playing with a death metal band, and then playing, you know, with a hardcore band. Um, you know, I got I that's how you learn. And um, you know, it was it was fun. And I was always playing, always on the road, always, always gigging. Was that your true passion or was wrestling? Uh both. I mean, I was an amateur wrestler um you know, since sixth grade. Um, so I was wrestling, I was playing, um, if, if I wasn't working out or, or, you know, wrestling or training, I was behind my kit, you know, playing or gigging. When you look at it, like you mentioned, Monster Factory, is that where you initially got in and trained? Cause that almost seems like very full circle that you're getting there in the business years ago, you know, like in the nineties training and then 2019 up until then training guys to be wrestlers. Yeah, that's where, um, like, I grew up uh, in, in that Ocean County area. There were a lot of, lot of you know, wrestlers came from there. I mean, I grew up with uh, Balls Mahoney. You know, we met um, my freshman year of high school. Uh, he wrestled for Manasquan. I wrestled for Brick. And we just started hanging out, two heavyweights, you know, just became friends. And uh, he introduced me to Candido. So we all grew up together. Um, and then, you know, of course, those, those two guys were going to – uh, Larry Sharps out in Paulsboro, <clears throat> and then they, they kind of got me in that way, and so that's how that was my introduction to Larry. Did you get like pushed into it, or is it like balls? You know, I, I gotta get in it <laughs> for for a long time. Like even in high school, they they were uh, uh, they were training, they were wrestling, um, and I wouldn't do it. I was kind of like, no, I'm, I'm I'm I wrestle real. You know, I'm a real wrestler, <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of had that attitude up until about ninety. One ninety one, ninety two, somewhere around there, um, and then th they would always try to get me in the ring, and um, I would never, I would never do it. I was always hanging around. I was always there, you know, going to shows, supporting them. Um, you know, I would help out and things like that. Uh, but one day, Balls wanted uh, he needed a ride to Larry's to the school, so I'm like, yeah, I'll give you a ride just to get me in the ring. I want to see what it's like, and he was so excited, and. Uh, we got there early. He uh, he showed me how to you know bump, uh, tuck your chin, you know how to hit the ropes, and then the guy started showing up for workouts. And at the time, uh, it was the headbangers were there, um, you know a couple other guys. Uh, Chuck Sloan was there. Gus the Greek was there. Uh, Jungle Jim McPherson was there. So all these guys start showing up, <clears throat> and these are guys I'd known just from being around it. But now they're like, oh, what, look, Wow, Bill you know, is going to, you know, he's in the ring and they beat the living shit out of me for about two hours. They beat me so bad. Uh, the headbangers superplexed me six times right in a row. Just like, Whoa. <laughs> they, you know, and, uh, afterwards I'm, I'm sitting on the, on the ground outside the ring and my lip was bleeding. My earlobe was actually torn away from my head and Ooh. it was like it was cut up in here. And I'm all just, just beat up and Larry walked by who I, whom I've known um, was like, kid, if you make it back next week, you don't, yeah, you don't have to pay me a dime. So I went home. I didn't get out of bed for two days. I was, my whole body uh, hurt. I couldn't move. I had a, um, a Coke bottle. I, I, I didn't go to the bathroom. I just, I just pissed in the Coke bottle. And uh, the next week John called me. He's like, are you going to go? I'm like, yeah, I'll pick you up at the, uh, you know, at two and we'll head out. And uh, if Larry would have walked by and said nothing, I probably would have never came back. But I took it as that ah, kid. <laughs> Good luck. And I'm like, you know, fuck you. I'm, you know, I'm not quitting. So yeah, that's uh, that's how I got into wrestling. <laughs> you think Larry was challenging you, or was he afraid you might sue him? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Larry was always very good to me, even before I was in the business. And uh, I don't. I'm not. I'm not too sure. He, he may be a little challenged. You know, um, maybe he saw something that, uh, you know, look, Larry was the first guy to, you know, really take an interest in, in, in anything I did, um, you know, musically or, or, or wrestling and really push me 
uh, really, Larry was getting in the ring with me. I, I never really saw Larry get in the ring with people, and Larry would get in the ring and show me stuff a lot. Um, he was the first person to book me on the show. He was the first person to pay me. And um, so I don't know. I like to think maybe he saw something and hoped that would come back. Right. With Larry, like what kind of guys in general? Because we always hear Monster Factory, Larry Sharp, you know, all these legendary names. But what kind of guy is he just in general? He was probably one of the one of the few true honest people in wrestling that I, I, I've you know, I know people, you know, has something to say about everybody, but from what I saw in my own personal experience, <clears throat> he he was a, a true dude. Um he, he was honest. If if you didn't have it, he'd tell you. You know, um, he, he didn't want you to waste your money, waste your time, things like that. Um, always honest with me, uh, honest with everybody um, that I've saw, you know, and always good, always supportive, you know. With him, like, how did he, because, like, not become like a legend or whatever, but a legendary trainer? Because when people think Monster Factor, even today, they think of like Bam Bam Bigelow and, you know, like, I mean, like, and, yeah. and all the legendary names and stuff and all the guys that came forward. Like, how did he kind of like come into that? Is it, is it luck? Is, is it some sort of relationship with WWF? I mean, how did Larry kind of become, you know, the, the legendary Monster Factory? Well, he was asked to train uh, Tony Atlas, I think was the first person. Um, I forget what territory he was in. And, uh, you know, Larry had an extensive um, amateur background. Um, and so he was asked, I think it was Tony Atlas was the first one. And it just kind of grew from there. Hey, can you train this guy? Can you train that guy? The Monster Factory uh, was started uh, by Larry and um, uh, Buddy Rogers um, and to, to train his son. And when his son didn't want to do it, you know, he says, like, Larry, take it, take it. You know, I don't want any part of it. You can have it. And that's kind of how the Monster Factory was was born. It's crazy to think Buddy Rogers originally was, you know, the seed that was planted there, you know, with, with the Monster Factory. All and Larry for, yeah. took, took it over, yeah. Yeah, all for his son, you know. And uh, they were in um, uh, a small building out in uh, Paulsboro. And it kind of moved around a little bit, you know. The, the, the best version of it, as far as I was concerned, was the building he had in um, Clemington, New Jersey. That's where I was trained, in the back of a flea market on Route 30. And they used to have huge shows there. He was running shows with Dennis Corluzzo. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with Dennis. Oh, yeah. And uh, the, their shows there were, you know, amazing. You know, uh, Larry had the WWA. Corluzzo had the NWA. And they were running these joint shows. I mean, they, they, would, they would draw a 1,000 people to this flea market and it was it was amazing it was an amazing uh atmosphere at the time and it, it, i was very lucky to, to get in at that point there and my first couple shows i worked were in front of those people who was like your main trainers when you really got rolling was it the headbangers uh no it was, it was uh balls mahoney really oh well, um, okay and then whoever would come around um you know me and john would go there uh, we were crazy. <laughs> um, like I look at these kids today and, and you know, they're complaining about showing up at uh, six o'clock and getting there on time. And then they had to leave early. Like me and John would get to the flea market, get into the uh, back. The ring was set up in the, in the arena area. We would get there at noon. The, the class, you know, class didn't start till six o'clock at night. So we get there at noon and me and John would roll until everyone started showing up at six. And then we would roll with those guys till about eight, nine o'clock. Now everything closed down. They would lock up the flea market. Well, me and John would hide, <laughs> and the security come around. They would lock up everything, and then we would stay in the ring till twelve one in the morning, and then try to sneak out without setting an alarm off, you know, and then go home. And we would, if we had the opportunity to train, we were training. And um, so it was mostly John. But when Larry was there, Larry, you know, if I went without John, uh, Larry was the one. You know, and then everybody else, you know, pick, you know, picks up. You know, if they had bangers in there, or or Chuck, or or Gus, or whoever, they would, you know, they would jump in and say, "Hey, you know, try this, try that." But mainly, it was John and 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 Larry. So, where do you start getting booked outside of just the Monster Factory and those <laughs> shows with Dennis? Like, where do you start getting booked? How do you get your name? And like, what do you go by? Was that with, like when you started out as the Nomad, or did you, did you change it up to something else? Oh, so I actually started. Um, so John Balls was doing um, a Buddha Sing, 
um, you know, from Singapore, you know, breathing fire. So I was kind of like a manager. I was the necromancer for a very short time. And um, after that, I, I would come out and as a tag team partner with him as my training progressed. Uh, we would breathe fire, you know, a Buddhist thing and the necromancer. Um, but um, then it changed to just Wild Bill. Um, that was my nickname since like middle school. So, yeah, I would just go on the road with John. You know, um, if John had two dates, I would just throw my bag in and basically, you know, help drive, get to these gigs. And, you know, like I, you tell students today, make yourself available. You need help, you know, setting the ring up. I'm here for you. If you need anybody extra, I got my gear, you know, my credentials. John can tell you, you know, and, and being trained by Larry Sharp was enough credentials to get you into anywhere. Right. You know, who trained you? Larry Sharp. Okay. You know, they knew, you know, okay, this guy, he's trustworthy. Um, we had just going on the road with John, introducing myself, networking. Uh, same things, you know, I would do with bands, you know, go to a club, hang out talk to the promoter, talk to whoever. If I didn't get on that show, maybe on the next show, you know? Um, but uh, it was, it was a good time because a lot of times I would work as the nomad or who wild bill under a hood. And it gave me the ability to work twice a night. Like I would work right. with, with John or whatever as a necromancer or whatever. And then I can go put the hood on, put different, you know, clothes, uh, you know, tights on and go work, uh, as as the nomad, so I would work twice a night. Sometimes I wouldn't get paid twice, but <laughs> I was going to ask you: Do you pay twice? <laughs> I wish. I was lucky if I was paid once, but <laughs> but yeah. um, but no, yeah. And it gave me an opportunity to really learn. Um, I think that's what's lacking, you know, nowadays. Uh, it's it's getting better, you know, the uh, the availability for for kids to go out there and get in front of people and really learn. But uh, that that really helped. When you're doing that and you're starting out on the road, like you said, you might not get paid. You may do this. Is that just paying your dues? You got to do what you got to do to try to get where you want to get? Yeah. I mean, at the time, I was used to it. Again, I came from, you know, touring in a band, you know, six of us in a van sleeping outside if we couldn't find somebody's house to crash out um, at, you know, and things like that. So I was kind of used to it, you know, not making that much money. So it wasn't a big deal for me. Um <clears throat> But um, yeah, I pay your dues, get out there. You know, I, I, I tell a story. I drove from New Jersey to Kentucky, wrestled a show uh, that I got on, um, and I was I was paid five dollars and change. <laughs> wow. In an envelope. I was like, this is heavy. What the hell's in here? It was five dollars and change. Oh, so Jesus. and then I had to, you know, I had no other bookings, and so I drove home. But uh, you, you, you get that experience and you meet people like I, I know I, I met people on, on, on that shows or those kind of shows that I'm still friends with today, you know, so it was worth it to me. So where are you getting booked as you like, you know, you're slowly moving up New Jack City Wrestling, maybe the legendary New Jack City <clears throat> Wrestling? Um, I th that whole time is, is such a blur. Um, I wrestle a lot in Maryland. Um MEWF, which is now uh, Maryland Championship Wrestling. That's where I, I met, uh, you know, Axel Rotten. I met all those guys. Um, um, who else was down there? I mean, so many people. Um, but uh, that's where I got a lot of experience going down there. And then, I, you know, hooked up with uh, this this cat named uh, Tom Cassati. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He was kind of like a promoter, backer, money guy. He also yep. was a manager. And... Uh, he would pay me out of, out of his pocket. You know, if a promoter was like, oh, yeah, I, I'll book Bill. Um, I can pay him 50 bucks. Tom would call me and say, hey, you know, I got you a payday. It's 150. So he would take the 50 and then kick in and he would pay for our hotel. He would pay for the rental car. And we just had to drive him around, you know, get him the show to show because he didn't have a car. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, you know, I got a lot of stuff through Tom. Uh, I was working – we were working three nights a week down there, um, you know, Friday night, Saturday, and, and sometimes two on Saturday. You do a matinee and then you do the night show and then a matinee on Sunday and we'd come home. It, it was it was a really good time all, all around Maryland, Virginia. I worked a lot down in Alexandria for uh, Cubo Carmichael down there, um, all over West Virginia, Virginia, Ohio. Um, it was uh, it was a good time. A lot of fun. 
I do remember you in New Jersey Indies too, you know, sporadically um, here and there for sure. I just remembered the New Jack City wrestling commercial. I don't think you're on it, but, you know, come play in our hood. Like, you know, you just <laughs> remember certain things like, oh, my God, like uh, so many guys like, you know, could pop in here and there at these random shows. But then later on, like Crowbar, Devin Stormy, he would pop up at those right. shows and then you see him on WWE TV or, or, or even um, WWF TV at one point. So it's like, wow, these guys are you see him locally, Simon Diamond, like, and then all, all of a sudden mm-hmm. they're on TV. So you were one of those guys too. It's like, I think I've seen yeah. him at a show. And then it's like, wow, now he's on TV. Yeah. I would, I mean, a lot of, a lot of those shows in Jersey, um, especially because you had Iron Mike Sharp in, in, in Asbury. Yep. And that's where a lot of those guys came from. And, and, and Mike, I was able to go, I would work out at Mike's um, on the days I wasn't training uh, at Larry. So like on Tuesday or Tuesday or Wednesday or whatever it was, I would go with Nova and uh, you know, and his guys to Mike's. And at the time, there you had uh, you had Nova, you had uh, Rick Ratchet, um, you had um, Jerry Tootie, the Wall, yep, um, and and a bunch of guys there. So I would go work out with them, you know. And so they had a had a click, we had a click, and I would take you know I would get booked on shows. They're like, hey, you know, there's a show in Tom's River. Can can you? Yeah, yeah, I get shows from them. I get, you know, and then I, my normal would be down in uh, down in Maryland, in Virginia. But yeah, the Jersey shows, they were a lot of fun. There were a lot of a lot of cool guys, a lot of really cool guys. I I, I still talk to a lot of those guys. Um, Devin Storm, A. Starling, by Quackenbush, like you said, Rick Rack. I mean, there's so many guys that like you just I just remember anyways. You know, being a Jersey guy, but you know, Simon Diamond, they would go on and and go to bigger places it's funny to think like wow this northeast scene like the guys were pretty damn good here the the whole new jersey area um i mean so many people came out of here like when we used to fly out uh in ecw you know we'd fly out uh, whenever on, on thursday or whatever uh for a show we'd all fly on the same flight because we're all together and we'd walk on there'd be like 15 20 of us strong and you're like wow is a a lot of us in this area, yeah. you know, and uh, you don't really think about that. But, yeah, it was a hotbed of uh, of pro wrestling. And, and I attribute that to, to Mike Sharp and, and to Larry Sharp. So what was Balls like, though, just to, to get back to Balls here? What is he really like? Because, you know, as a fan, and I've interviewed him before me, obviously, many years ago before he passed. But it's like, man, this guy is nuts. But you don't know if he's working. You don't know if if, if he's because you know, he's on air. If, like, is he really crazy? So what is Paul's nuts? Is he not? Is, is he a good guy? What do you think about Paul's? Obviously, good friend of yours forever. Um, I love John. Um, you know, I've known John since freshman year of high school. So I have a lot of extra years of John stories. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, what you saw is is really what he was like. He, he was crazy. He was, he was nuts. Um, but the most loving guy, one of the most loving guys I've ever seen, um, give you the shirt off his back. Um, when I did my first um, extra work at WWF, um, I didn't. My car really wasn't in good shape, and I got the call. And I called John. I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And uh, John rented me a car, and his wow. name paid for it, picked it up, gave it to me, and said, just you know, return it, and uh, you don't have to pay me back. So he paid for the rental car for me to go up and do um, Madison Square Garden and um, Albany and uh, didn't want any money and never brought it up again. Just paid for it and you do it, you know, take it. So that's the kind of guy he was like. Um, we go to bat for you. Um, you know, in ECW, he, he would always push for me, um, you know, but he, he was he was touched. <laughs> he was uh I, i've seen john do a lot of crazy things and you know I, I i always tried to help you know my job on the road with john early before ecw was to keep him out of jail <laughs> and um it, it, sometimes it was it was tough i mean he would get into a fight in a bar just swing at somebody um i had to talk him out of it get him out of the bar to hide him somewhere um things like that but um uh, he was uh, a true and honest dude, and 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 give the shit off his back if he could. How'd you get the WBF extra work? You know, just a, a side there because I'm very curious. Like, how do you get that? Who calls you? What do they say? Is it through Larry? For uh, for well, in the beginning it was through Larry. Um, 
it, at that that time it was um through Candido. Oh, okay. Yeah, so he was kind of doing both. He was he was in ECW. He was um, you know up there, and they needed some extras, and he called me. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. I do a show with Doctor Tom. I talk to him all the time. He was saying that Candido, like when he was in WWF, so young, but he was saying like they put him in charge of extras. They put did this. They were almost going to make him the trainer of like you know like The Rock and Kurt and all those guys instead of Doctor Tom. Even though Doctor Tom was older and had more experience, like wow, it's like he's so mature for his age. But you know, you think of Candido, he's so young. He died obviously died so young, but you don't think of like him being in charge of like all this stuff. But he was like res very responsible guy and even yeah. thought of well in WWF. Yeah, he he was amazing in the ring. Uh, I look back at some of those videos he, today. You know, they'll pop up on YouTube, and I, I have to watch them. He was he was amazing in there and had so much knowledge. I mean, I knew I, I well. He grew up around it. His grandfather was a, a was a wrestler doing the shows when he you know we were you know little kids. Um, he had no choice but to to be so knowledgeable, you know. And if you watch his matches. Unbelievable, unbelievable. He was smooth. He was funny. Uh, one of the best, as far as I'm concerned. So when he brings you in, are you actually wrestling? Are you doing like the enhancement matches? What are you doing as far as being an extra? Uh, well, for him, I was just doing extra work. Um, that was the um, the weekend I was the uh, cop with the Steve Austin thing. So, oh, which which uh, was it when he gets arrested? Yeah, I was the one that put the handcuffs on him. Wow, I didn't realize that. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> How do they tell you that? Like, by the way, you're the cop. You're going to be putting the handcuffs. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, well, actually, yeah. It, <laughs> so he told me just, you know, bring black boots, not wrestling boots. Um, you know, uh, shave your face clean uh, and, and shave your head. But back then I had like a high and tight at the time. He's like, shave it all one you know, level and shave your face clean. Be at the garden this time. I'll see you there. So... I uh, get to the garden, <laughs> and uh, I think the headbangers rid me. That's the first people I see there are the headbangers. And uh, I'm like, hey, I'm supposed to meet Candido. They're like, oh, what are you doing here, Wild Bill? I'm like, oh, you know, Candido called me. He's like, oh, awesome. Yeah, he's in He's in catering. I'm like, okay. And uh, I, I see, you know, you have to follow the little signs everywhere. Oh, here's catering. I open the door, and it's all the top brass. There's McMahon. There's all these people. <laughs> I took one step in. Everybody kind of looks at me. I'm like, I take a step out. I'm like, oh, you motherfucker, you rid me. <laughs> they got <laughs> but, you. Uh, yeah. yeah, they didn't tell me what we were doing. And then um, so it was a couple of Monster Factory guys. It was me, Danny McDevitt from uh, Maryland Championship Wrestling, yep. uh, Corporal Punishment, um, a guy from the Monster uh, Monster Factory called Budlicious. He was a short guy with a shaved head and glasses. And one of Candido's friends who wasn't in the business uh, for some reason um, – but they, they pull us aside and then they tell us what we're going to do. And then they pull us into this office and then everyone starts walking in like Vince and then uh, Owen, <laughs> all the top brass, um, Goldust, Marlena. I mean, all, all the people who were involved in that whole, you know, build up come walking in, door gets locked. And then they tell everybody what we're going to do. And because at that time, you know, you had the, the Monday Night Raws. Uh, Monday Night uh, Wars, excuse me. Um, so they didn't need, they didn't want that getting out. So like we were kind of sequestered <laughs> yeah. as extras, yep. and um, it was kind of crazy. So the, a lot of people don't know that the the build up to that was um, uh, was um, Owen and um, oh god, um, I forget. It was it was Owen and, and somebody. It was a like hard foundation against each other. Uh, Marlena was taken away from Goldust. So we go out with Owen to protect him. You know, he had this, this restraining order against uh, Steve Austin. And then end of the match, <clears throat> Goldust comes down. There's a big to-do. Owen's left in the ring. Austin comes over the rail, goes after him. We jump in the ring, and then we do the whole thing. But um, it was fun. It was – if you look at that video, too, it's uh, – in the back, they go over – they give me the, the, the cuffs – they're like, you're going to put the, uh, the cuff. I'm like, oh, okay. So there's a real cop back there. A real cop shows me how to put the cuffs on right, do all this stuff. Okay, cool. So Austin's there. So I'm like, okay, I practice it a couple times. Now he's just standing still. So I'm like, on, off, on, off, on, off. This is easy. We get out there. I'm going to put the cuffs on. I got the one wrist on, and he's moving around. 
And if you notice, it takes a while for me to get that cuff on because he's moving around. I'm like, yeah. And now I'm shitting my pants. I'm like, I'm going to fuck this up in front of everybody here. <laughs> and I, you see me look up real quick and look back down. I said, I fucking dare you to stand still. <laughs> so he stands <laughs> still. I put the cuff on and they walk him away. And then if you see me, I, I go, oh. <laughs> yeah. a sigh of relief. Because I was like, oh, in my head, I'm like, I'm going to fuck this up. Oh, God. God. But uh, yeah, it was pretty funny. Did anybody in the back say anything to you? Like, hey, uh, what happened out there? Like, why didn't you know? They were talking more about Vince's shitty bump. <laughs> oh, God. Oh. <laughs> that is one of the worst. He takes the worst stunner, even at Mania this year. Oh, so bad. <laughs> I just remember coming through the curtain and then, like, you know, just hearing people laughing and, 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 and talking about it. That, that was the next night uh, we taped for um, Raw the next week at the. Um, at uh, the Albany Pepsi Arena in uh, um, up there, Knickerbock Arena or whatever it was called at the time. And that was where we come out. And it was kind of stolen from ECW. We had the, the ride helmets on, protecting Owen. And yep. then we're all looking each other way. And then, you know, Austin reveals himself to be under the one. And then, so we chase Austin. So we're in the meeting beforehand, Pat Patterson, everybody. So like, okay, you're going to, uh, and he's going to run through the crowd and you're going to chase him. And I raised my hand. I'm like, are you going to have security over there by the railing so we can get over? Like, you're a police. They'll let you over. I'm like, this is the number one <laughs> baby face ever. The fans aren't going to let us arrest this guy. You should probably have. They're like, ah, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Well, sure enough, do the thing. Boom, boom. He, he goes over. He runs. And we go after him. He got kids grabbing our legs, biting our legs. Like, they they, <laughs> they wouldn't let us over the rail. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it, was, it was funny. By the time we finally got over, they were already in commercial. <laughs> and we run up. And then, you know, the three of us were just like, it, we're in the concourse. Nobody's around. We're in police outfits. There's people buying sodas and popcorn looking at us like, what are you doing? And we're like, looking for Austin. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it was, yeah, it was fun. That's awesome to just, if you look back, like be in that spot because Austin is about to go into the stratosphere. I mean, he was the most popular guy by far. You know what I mean? As far as yeah. the WF was concerned, it's like insane. Pretty cool to be around and be a part of that. Yeah. It's, um, of all the things I've done, that's what people, uh, uh bring up the most. Like, oh, you put the handcuffs on Austin. I'm like, I've done other things. <laughs> right. Right. I, I was an ECW. Come on. <laughs> Did you ever wrestle for WWF? Uh, just job or work back early for uh, for. Do you Larry. remember who you work? Uh, I think I I was part of a team with Men on a Mission. Um, Crush was there. I didn't do much. Um, I did a lot most of the stuff as extras when I was in ECW. As as weird as that is, uh, most of it came through through ECW. Um, so, any of those guys take advantage or no? No. No, most everybody. I, I work so many uh, of those guys on independent shows too, um, and nobody ever took advantage of me. Nobody ever took liberties. I mean, I've, I've heard crazy stories, um, but nobody, nobody really took liberties with me. I, I don't know if it was me or just I. I, I got to work mostly the cool guys. <laughs> yeah, funny. I, I know PJ. I was just incredible, really well, and it looks like the Steiner brothers kill him, and he said no. And I was reading even people online, like, you know, like the rest of the media, like, oh, yeah, the Steiner Bros, bad reputation for hurting people. And I was asking DeVito, incredible. They said, not at all, but it looked like he, they killed them, like murdered them. <laughs> and that, and it, even if you go back and look, but they really weren't. So I was like, oh, I wonder how the wrestlers feel versus how people watching it feel. I mean, the people watching it feel being worked, and the people are in the wrestling are part of the work. Yeah, I mean, I attribute that to, to you know, um, Justin and, and DeVito and those guys. Um you can make those guys look like they're murdering you. I mean, when I first got to ECW, I was basically, you know, enhancement, you know. Um, but a, a lot of the guys, I mean, Sabu would ask to work me all the time. Um, there's a match, uh, one of my first matches in ECW was with Sabu from Buffalo. That's on YouTube somewhere. And he just destroys me. And people are like, my God, how did you live through that? I'm like, I never felt a thing. The only thing I felt was when he... Uh, jumped over and went put me through the table. The table didn't break, and he landed on my chest. <laughs> Whoa, um, not, not good. 
Yeah, well, the ring crew bought the wrong size table. So it's supposed to be like the eight foot tables. Well, they bought like the six foot one. They don't uh, break. They yeah, don't break as easy because they're smaller. <laughs> they're, they're stronger. Yeah. So yeah, Van Dam puts me on the table on the outside. He runs up, hits the chair, hits the top rope, and just boom, table don't move. And he's like, "Fuck, do it again." I'm like, "Oh my god!" And this time he just jumps over the top rope, hits the table doesn't break again, but the legs break, so it kind of goes, eh, boom. <laughs> And I think he hurt himself, and he's like, fuck it, we'll take it home. I'm like, okay. And then he puts the chair in my face, does the drop kick, and it looks like it destroys my face. Never touched me. So it, it's it's how you work. Yeah, it, it definitely. It's how you do it. How did you get in ECW? Was that balls bringing you in? So, yeah, going back to um, if if I had, didn't have a booking or anything, I would go with John. I'd throw my stuff, and I'd go on the road with him. Make yourself available, help out when you can. Um, we were in Waltham, Massachusetts, and um, I was just sitting there. I mean, I knew half the locker room, you know, uh, most of the guys come from the Northeast anyway. And um, they said, Hey, Bill, you know, come over here. We need somebody to work Axel. I'm like, Sure, well, I'll go get my gear. So I went to the car, got my gear, and um, I've known Axel for a long time. We've wrestled a couple times in Maryland. So it was, I was comfortable as hell. So I went out there, and Axel wanted to take this new finish. He's like, oh, I got this finish. You know, I pick you up backwards, and I oh, just drop you down. He's like, just jump. I'm like, okay. Well, he only wanted me to go, like, horizontal to the to the ground. Well, I jumped, and I was straight up and down like a suplex. Oh. So when he came down, it looked like he broke my neck, like a crazy reverse spine buster, like insane. Right. So <clears throat> just – you know, knowing the, the, the business, I'm, I'm, I'm not getting up from this. Um, you know, you see a lot of guys take all these moves today and they just pop right up, you know, walk back. I'm like, nope, I'm selling the shit out of this. So I sold it. Medical people came out um, and they, you know, carried me back. And um, people thought I was I was dead. I came through the curtain. I stood up and, and uh, Paul standing there. And he's like, he thought I was dead. He's like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just selling. He's like, you're hired. <laughs> wow. So that's how I got my job. <laughs> so he liked the sell so much. I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, as soon as I was like, no, I'm fine. I was just selling. And he's like, you're hired. <laughs> wow. That's great. What did you think of Paul? Um, I, I uh, He was just as crazy as Mahoney. <laughs> um, I can tell you some stories of some nights out. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I... Uh, I, th I thought a lot of Paul um, until the end. I thought the end could have been handled better. It is what it is. Um, but uh, as far as like a mind for the business, I, I think there's um, probably very few that are better. Um, but I mean, even at the end, it, Paul wasn't there. You know, Tommy was running everything. And um, but I, I believe that Tommy learned what he learned from from Paul. Right. So it was still all Paul. When you look at it with Paul and you're saying he might be as crazy as balls, are you allowed to mention those stories or not allowed to mention those stories with him? Um, just, you know, uh, some, some nights going out, like, you know, um, uh, <laughs> just uh, he's, he's, yeah, everyone's just as crazy in their own idiom. And he's just as crazy. Uh, let's put it that way. He was a partier, like the party. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I could tell that. What was that <laughs> club? Uh, that club in New York that he used to love, Club Fifty Nine or whatever it is. Wasn't there some big club that he used to love in in New York City? Well, not Studio Fifty Four. Studio Fifty Four, was... that club, duh. Studio yeah, Fifty Four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's um. Well, he didn't work there, but that was like his 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 his, his place to hang out. Yeah, didn't he though? Didn't he book people for that? Didn't he at one point like actually bring acts in, or they were just friends of his that they were saying hang out with? I'm not sure. I've heard stories like that, but I'm I'm not sure what's what's true and what's not. Man, that's funny to be uh, like, okay, balls is nuts. And like, Heyman might be as nuts as balls. Like, wow, that's uh, that's not great. You know what I mean? Uh, it's a little cool. At, at that time, it was, it was, um, when I first got the ECW, it was just all out insanity. It was, um, balls fit right in. <laughs> like, you know, um, but as you know, we started getting bigger, we started getting, you know, more TV, more stuff. Things had to calm down a bit. Um, 
and John didn't. <laughs> yep. Um, but uh yeah, it was it was it was it was crazy times. Um, you know, you hear the story all the stories about uh you know Sandman dying and coming back and then wrestling that night. You, you hear all the stories, and all that shit's true. Um, you know, I tell people these these stories, uh, you know, once I get drinking and so I start telling people asking me stories, they can't believe it. And I'm like, here, go on YouTube. All these other people are telling the same story. People can't believe that that shit happened, but it, it did. And um it was crazy. <laughs> Man, there are like so many crazy stories out there. The thing that's so interesting to me, though, is yes, there's those crazy stories. And I know some people like absolutely love those stories, or they're almost like fearful of those stories of like, what the hell was going on there? I'm always fascinated with, like, I just talked to Devon Dudley about it. Everybody had like two or three jobs. I'm like, wow, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, everybody's crazy. They're wild, but yet they're crazy and wild in their own way. And they're doing we responsible. I was going to say, but responsible <laughs> somehow because you got guys working marketing, guys working merchandise, mm -hmm. guys answering phones, but they're all wrestlers. You got maybe you're doing timekeeping or setting up the ring or you know whatever, but you're also wrestling. So I mean, you have two, maybe three jobs. That's what fascinates me. It's like the crazy yeah. end, the high end of the spectrum. There, everybody's nuts, drugs, steroids, you know, whatever, sex, drugs, rock and roll, and then down over here, responsible. Let's do two or three jobs. Let's make sure this. Oh yeah, like, I had like know, four jobs. Running. I, I, I drove the ring truck. I was a ring crew foreman, so I was in I was in charge of setting up the ring, setting up the arena, the entranceway curtains, all that stuff. Uh, wrestled, and then um, because of my background, unlike TV and pay per view, I was like an assistant audio engineer. So I would help the sound guy. I you know run sound with him, um, and um, I, I never stopped. You know. As soon as, as soon as I was done the ring, I changed. Okay, now it's time to break down the ring, break down the ring, load in the truck, now drive the truck. Now, you know, get set up the arena, you know, do all that. Boom, boom, boom. Do that. Okay, now get to the back, wrestle, help the sound guy. Like there were on pay-per-views, I would go out and work, come through the come through the uh, curtain, throw a hockey jersey on and run out and then throw the headset on and, and help do sound. Yeah. <laughs> so and then if the, if the sound guy, Randy. Uh, I had something where he couldn't make it. It was I did everything. I did all the sound. So I'm setting everything up. Now I got to set up the sound. Now I, I'm wrestling. Now I'm doing sound. You know, like Jeff Jones would hit, you know, pause and play on the music while I was out there. Then I'd come back and then I would do everything else. Um, it was uh, it was a lot of work, <laughs> but um, a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Yeah, it just amazes me. It's like, wow, what a crazy atmosphere. But yet, you know the guys that are crazy also are doing two other things to keep the company afloat and keep it running. Yeah. I mean, especially driving that, the, the ring crew guys, I, 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 all those guys, um, at the time that I was, uh, in it, it was like me, Chris Chetty, Danny Doring, uh, the three of us in a ring truck, nothing can happen there, but, right. uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we were driving, you think about it, we were driving the truck, which was really illegal. You know, we it was a commercial truck. We had no commercial licenses. We never kept any logbooks. We would pass. We would never stop at a uh, um, a, a, a way station, which was completely illegal. Right. Um, <laughs> so, and if we did get pulled over, it, it, you you know, we got pulled over once. Um, where the hell were we going down to Atlanta? I was driving, and we started having logbooks in the truck, but we never filled them out. So now. We they pull us over. So I grab the logbook. I'm doing math in my head, hours, time, distance, and I'm writing this logbook down. And the guy comes up. So we get out of that. We have a logbook, but I'm out of time. I have to come off the road. So he made us pull over. He's like, yeah, next exit, there's a hotel. You have to come off the road for eight hours. Okay, so now we can't drive on the highway. So we get off the road. I get the Rand McNally. I find all these crazy, weird back roads through the mountains. And here we are up and down the mountains with this ring truck going down roads that weren't built for trucks because mm -hmm. we can't go on the highway because the state police are looking for us. Right. <laughs> so shit like that, you know. Um, and you guys just, are responsible for the ring. You couldn't have the show without it. And yeah, if we if I don't do this and get get there, there's no show. So it's up to me and, and Danny and, and, and Chris to. You know, I felt like smoking in the bandit. I'm out, out, out running the law, <laughs> trying to get to this town. Yep. But um, yeah, I would have no other way. It was uh, it was fun. 
funny you don't think about that when you're a fan like watching the show like ah, i wonder how the ring gets there like you know what i mean like you, you don't think of yeah. stuff like that you just think oh, it's automatically it, yeah. there yeah you guys have to drive it and illegally drive it around <laughs> yeah totally illegal and uh Oh man! But those poor guys. Uh, when I got off of it, uh, uh, they, like the Vito was on the ring crew for a while. Uh, Spanish Angel from the Baldies. Um, I mean, when I first got there, Spike, Mike, uh, Mikey Whipwreck, they were on the ring crew. And uh, but we would have it. I mean, there was no lollygagging. Nobody fucked around. Show was over. We loaded up that truck, and we were gone because we knew the bar closed at two. So we had to get everything packed up. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> just gotta make it to the bar. Yep. Very smart. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, like you don't think about stuff like that. Like if, like the inner workings of what's going on, but like the third biggest wrestling company, they're you know, they're driving around with a wrestling truck. Like that is so typical ECW, but you don't normally think of that with wrestling. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. wow, these guys might not make the town, they might not have a show, they might not have the ring. Well, and then when I graduated off the, off the ring crew, I um I was dating the um, the my well, my first wife. She was the the in charge of the merchandise. Uh, so I was dating her at the time. So I was help you know put in charge of helping there. So now instead of loading the ring, I'm loading up all the merchandise. I'm count all the merchandise and put that in the van and drive that van instead of the truck. So one thing or the other. <laughs> right, right. But you're still responsible for a decent amount of uh, yeah stuff, you know, for the show. I mean, the show must go on with the ring, but you also want the merch so you can make some money for everybody. Yep. <laughs> so when you kind of moving on up, if you will, in ECW, like as you're you know you're climbing the ladder, climbing the card, when do you you know get off of you know maybe enhance the matches or whatever you want to call them matches, and you start becoming a part of like Dangerous Alliance, Louis Dangerous League? Like, how do you make that leap? Like, what happens for that? Um, well, the, the, the Dangerous Alliance came about was just, um, I was coming off an injury. Um, I was actually with, when, when Stevie left and, and, um, Steve Richards, yep. I kind of took over in that, in that BWO kind of thing. Um, there was Nova, Meanie and me, and they put me out there as uh, Boogaloo Bill Wiles. I just, I break, I was, I break danced. It was very short because um, one night Nicole Bass dropped me on my head trying to power bomb me and broke three of my ribs and my oh. sternum and hurt my neck and put me out for a while. So coming back, just plodding around looking for a place, you know, to put me. And my wrestling style and and CW's wrestling style were very similar. And, and we would we'd hang out. We would talk about who influenced us. It was the same people who influenced us. They were. Uh, we had the same, you know, people we revered, you know, Bobby Eaton, Arn Anderson, you know, Four Horsemen, things like that. So we wrestled alike. So we would do that training. We would have a training every, uh, before every show. So we would work out and we would do some things. And it was Nova who went, I think, to, to Dreamer was like, you should put these two guys together. And I think it was in Jacksonville or, or somewhere. And uh, we went out and worked Danny and Roadkill. And it kind of clicked, you know, we just went out there and, and we were natural the way we tagged each other, the way we, you know, we worked the body part, you know, that old school way. And it kind of just went from there. So we started dressing like the you know, Minnesota Wrecking Crew with the jackets and stuff like that. And then with Lou, they progressed Lou to Louie. They're like, well, it's a natural. You got to go with these guys. So that's when we became uh, the Dangerous Alliance. And then just kind of we started out kind of like comedy. Um, really just as a rib to Paul. Um, yeah. And then we just, we eventually evolved more serious and we're taking more serious. And then we know, of course we got Electra, and it was up from there, but it's, it's weird how it started just by Nova saying, you should put these two guys together. They're, they're similar. Right. And then obviously you're beautiful Bobby Eaton, they're beautiful Billy Wiles. And obviously CW Anderson yeah. is Arn Anderson when they, well, obviously great team in WCW when they were part of the dangerous Alliance, which yeah. you guys would become. Well, my concern was like I don't look like Bobby Eaton. I don't have the hair. Right, I don't have like right. you know. Um, and they they just told me like, well, just you know, do something flashy, do something okay. And I was always an Elvis fan, so I started incorporating you know the glasses and 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 you know jackets and stuff like that. Um, so that's what I did. <laughs> 
love like the not the mockery, but you know, obviously it, it's the Danger Alliance, the great group. Electra joins. She's kind of like the Medusa. Obviously, Paul Heyman right. is the Louis Dangerously. Just funny the way it all kind of goes together. Eventually, um, you know, you'd add a few other guys to get Simon Diamond and almost uh, Eric Watts for for a little bit. <laughs> joined the Eric group. Watts was the first. Um, okay. Um, we had Electra, and then Eric came in, and then they put him with us. Um, I don't know what happened to him. He was in and out and out. Um, wasn't steady. And then uh, Simon Diamond, all that came after I split out. Okay. Um, so like CW and I kind of went our separate ways. Um, he kind of went with them and then I became Bill this. What, like, what is that though? Like, how did that come about? Who creates that? Did you bring that up? Did Dream no. make that up? No, I would have never created that. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, that was Paul Heyman. Um, so we had the big blow off in, um, in the arena, and that's when Bobby Eaton hits the ring and they do all the stuff, and I kind of just leave. So that night, I'm like, where do we go from here? Because in my eyes, old school, you know, you would have us break up for some reason, and then I would feud with CW. And uh, we figured well, this, this would be awesome. We could do some great stuff. We'd beat the shit out of each other. Bleed all, like, you know, yeah. old school feud, you know, between two tag partners. But that, you know, Paul is going to push him this way and put me that way. And Paul pulled me into the um, in the office there in, at the arena. And he's like, okay, we're going to change you all up. We're going to, you know, do this, do that. And we're going to call you Bill This Wesley. And uh, your reaction right there is the same as mine. So <laughs> I was like, I go, hasn't this already been done? Like, we've already seen the honky tonk man. Like, he's like, no, it's going to be great. So I, I actually, I, I was sitting out getting dressed, getting all my stuff together. And I told Nova about everything. And I'm like, I think I'm done. I'm, I'm not coming back. Wow. And he's like, no, you know, you, you know, you can do this. You know, you can make it your own. And I'm like, I, I'm not comfortable with it. I don't like it. Um, I was a huge honky tonk fan, so I'm right. like, this is, this is this is more than you know parody. This is you know outright mockery. <laughs> and he's like, no. So he lives by me. So you know we would hang out every Monday and Tuesday night, and Wednesday night if we were available. And uh, so just talking to Nova, and he's like, you can do it your own way. You can do this. So my idea for it was like, okay, I'm gonna be a pilled up, you know drug addict Elvis, like all fucked up and I'm going to do all sorts of stuff. Yeah. pills falling out of my pocket <laughs> and stuff like that. I ordered a, um, a jumpsuit and things like that. And uh, they just wouldn't let me do the, the drug stuff. The, um, you know, being all fucked up and everything. Right. So it just became a parody of, you know, uh, of the honky tonk man. So it is what it is. It wasn't my favorite thing to do, but I mean, you know, it was it. It was something. <laughs> what a weird thing! It's just like a dangerous alliance, maybe feud with CW, like you said, or you know, do something there. And all of a sudden, Paul's just like literally out of left field. Why don't you be an Elvis impersonator? Why don't you be the next honky tonk man? It's like, what? Where did that come from? Like, what the hell? Yeah. Was like, I was doing a lot of Elvis stuff anyway. You know, um, I would we would hit the dangerous alliance pose, and I would do the Elvis pose. Right. Right. Yeah. True. Was, you know, things like that. So, I mean, I guess. It was a natural transition, maybe, maybe, but uh, I still feel that me and CW had a, at least a year of a feud together. Like you, you could have drawn that out for a long time. Us breaking up, um, you know, because on TV a couple weeks before, I was attacked by Simon and those guys and left laying. He just walked away, you know, and uh, I think we could have done a, a lot with that, but um, it just wasn't in the cards. So then, of course, you mentioned for the end of ECW, were you shocked, surprised? Did you see it coming? Like you said, Paul wasn't really around that much. Dreamers in charge of the show. Obviously, you know, different things yeah. are going on there. What did you think? Like shocked or no? Well, we we went through a, a phase like that before. You know, we were checks were bouncing and we rebounded. So at first you're like, OK, this is just another, you know, uh, you know, we're going to bounce back from this again. And then the longer it starts to go, you're like, eh. and then you start seeing the writing on the wall. You know, a lot of big names aren't showing up now. And so you're like, okay, these guys, if these guys aren't getting paid, I'm definitely not getting paid, you know? And then you just kind of, and then you get your booking sheet, you know, like, oh, here's the next month. This is where I need to be. Okay. 
Um, and those sheets stopped coming. And then it's like, okay, next week and next week. And then finally, after the pay-per-view at the Hammerstein Ballroom, there was nothing um, except the next week in Poplar Buff, Bluff or whatever it was. Yep. Um, Ar- Arkansas or whatever. Nothing after that. And those were paid shows. Those were bought shows. Those weren't even our shows. So <clears throat> I knew right there. You know, and Paul's giving the speech, I'm going to go to L.A., I'm not coming back till I have a new TV deal. Well, I, I read the sheets and I know you're going out to film rollerball, <laughs> you know? Yep. Um, so yeah, don't piss on my leg and tell me it's raining. I know what you're doing out there. So I knew it, you know, and, and most of everybody knew it. Um, it just sucked accepting it. Yeah. They accept it. And a lot of guys have been there, have given so much of their life. Like you said, you know, everybody worked two, three, four jobs in the company when you've given yourself that much into this product, it's hard to accept that this is it. This is the end and there's no more. Like like that, the lights are out. And uh, that was the hardest part. Did you even go to the final shows? No, I didn't. No. You knew. Like, eh, it's probably the end. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, we haven't been paid for quite a while. And uh, like I said, uh, I was traveling, you know, my girlfriend at the time who became my wife. Um, doing the uh, merchandise. So, you know, we were putting out a lot of money that we're supposed to get reimbursed, you know, because, you know, we're traveling with the merchandise, we're, you know, the van, the gas, the, you know, things like that, um, that we weren't getting reimbursed anymore. So I, 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 I'm like, I can't put out any more money and not have it come back. So I didn't go. Yeah, that, that's the crazy part because it's like, okay, checks are bouncing, but you're also putting out your own money to help <clears> the promotion and you're supposed to be getting back because, you know, you don't own the promotion. They need to pay you back and they don't pay you back. It's crazy. Yeah, that sucks. Yeah, I mean, New York was close. Like, you know, I, I live in New Jersey, so, okay, I, I can get to these shows, you know, Pennsylvania, wherever, but I'm, I'm not going to Pine Bluff, you know. Yeah, wherever. Arkansas, yeah. <laughs> So, um, and, and that was it. I, I knew it. And then, you know, um, like I said, every Monday and Tuesday night, uh, the Jersey guys, you know, me, Nova, a bunch of guys from like Mike Sharps, like uh, Lupus, who used to be with the you know, Raven. Yep. Kent, he used to be there. And then uh, Nova's brother, you know, we would get together every Monday, Tuesday night. Donnie B. And then, Donnie B. And then we're, you know, we we're watching Raw that night. You know, and then there's there's Paul. So, you know, me and Nova kind of looked at each other. We're like, well, I guess this is it, huh? You know, but you knew before that. That was just you, a nail in the coffin. Did you guys know that he was doing something with WWF, like even before that, as far as like taking money from WWF with Vince or no? I didn't know. We didn't know. Well, I can't speak for them, but I didn't know, um, you know, that I knew Vince was helping because being on the ring crew. You know, so like when we did the hole in the uh, ring uh, for uh, Bam Bam and, Bam Bam and uh, Taz, yep. well, that was built by Vince's crew. So we got, went up to Brooklyn to, to his, you know, stage production crew, and they built all that. So that was coming from – so we knew there was at least a working relationship. You know, a lot of things we we would pick up or we would do would come from through Vince's people. So I knew there was a working relationship. I didn't know that, you know, Vince's money was keeping, you know, things alive and, and things like that. I knew that a lot of uh, guys would be sent to us to be like, you know, not trained, but like, uh, like, like when he, like when uh, Al Snow came to us, groom you know, him. Yep. groom them, um, you know, things, guys like that. So they would come here, you know, we would you know, freshen them up a bit and polish them up and then boom, you know, send them back. So I knew there was a working relationship, but the, the whole money thing, um, we weren't aware of it was that deep. Crazy to the end of ECW. What a shame because then WCW's gone right thereafter, and wrestling wasn't uh, quite the same since for about 20 years there with no competition. It was pretty, you know, pretty boring for the most part. Yeah, it, um, yeah, it wasn't the same. Uh, at that time, you know, when ECW folded, I was just burned out. And I was just like, you know, I, I don't even know how I want to do this anymore. I, I would take uh, very, very little bookings. Like uh, my my first kid was just born, and uh, I kind of just backed away from it. By 2003, I was totally done of, you know, for traveling or doing anything. Retired, done, done with the biz. 
Yeah, I, I, I changed phone numbers. I, you know, my email address, and I just kind of was like, all right, I'm done with this. I went right back to playing with the band, actually. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> By the end of 2003, I was back on the road with the band. So Nice, nice. Where you should be. <laughs> yeah, nice. But as we hit the wind down here, we head towards the finish. What's next for you? What do you what do you got coming up? Just any anything wrestling related or staying away, staying with work? No, not not really. I like I said, I stepped away from wrestling. I, I still talk to some of the guys that, that I've coached and, and things like that that are down there in, in AEW and things like that. And um, you know, on Facebook, I was like, Hey, I you know I saw this, uh, you know, what are you doing? Try this, or or they'll say, Hey, did you see that? What do you think? And that's about it, you know. They'll send me a link to a video and be like, hey, you know, tell me what you think. That's really, that's my extent of pro wrestling now. If you weren't hurt, though, if you didn't have the back injury, would you be done with it, you think? Or you think you'd be interested? I'd still coach. I'd still coach. Yeah, I love coaching. Coaching so much fun. Um, you know, I coached two years of amateur wrestling when I graduated high school while I was uh, going through college and everything. Um, I like coaching. I used to be a drum instructor. So teaching, I, I, I'm comfortable with and I like it. What do you think, though, as far as like wrestling today? Just are you a fan of it, not a fan of it, or to be honest, I really don't watch. Wow, okay. <laughs> I, I really don't watch it, and like I like I said, unless somebody sends me something like, "Hey," or they, you know, they say, "Hey, I'm going to be on," you know, Monday or whatever. Uh, check this out. Um, I, I really don't like, follow it. Um, you know, other than I have so many people at my job are like, "Oh, did you see?" I'm like, "Ah, no." <laughs> <laughs> but uh, since they took away the, the the WWE network and they put it on Peacock, I used to get it for free. Uh, now I'm not going to pay for it. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, forget that. Yeah, I'm yeah. Sure. I used to watch WrestleMania. I used to watch SummerSlam. You know, just because. Uh, but I'm not paying for that. So <laughs> I got gotcha. you. So do you stay like relevant as far as the business, like doing signings, anything like that? Like, do you do you put your socials out there and stuff, or are you per, ba yeah, basically like, kind of done for the most part? Yeah, my socials are, are out there. My my Facebook is pretty private. I have a um, um, a page for my vlog is on there, the wild side. Um, but I can't, I keep my Facebook page kind of you know private. Um, but my Instagram's out there. I got two different Instagrams. I got my wild but wilds. I have my wild side for my travel vlog. Uh, same thing with um, uh, with Facebook. I don't do Twitter. Um, and I just, my wife got me involved in TikTok. I haven't posted anything, but she made me create a TikTok. And uh, I haven't used it. I don't, I don't see me using it at all. But right. uh, <laughs> So as far as uh, you and wrestling, never say never, though, right? I mean, you never say never. And trust me, if, if I, you know, if I could, I, I would. I mean, to, I would still wrestle today if I could. But wow. uh, very, I mean, you know as best I could, but, um, I haven't been able to work out in a couple of years and, and, and things like that. So, um, I'm not in the best shape, but, uh, but yeah, I love it. I mean, I love pro wrestling. I, I, and just like, I love, you know, music and, um, I, I love being around it. Coaching was great. I, I think I would coach, you know, but coaching, I would still get in and, and roll with the guys. And then I would wrestle on, on the monster factory show. Some of the students, you know, and, um, it's fun and it's a learning experience for them, get them comfortable and it's just fun. But, um, yeah, I just, I'm not able to do it right now, <laughs> but you still love the business though. That's good. I still love it. It's, it's the, I think it's the creativity. I'm, I'm very creative. I, I have to create. So it's just like a music I'm creating, uh, with wrestling, I'm creating, I'm performing There's an audience, you know, in, in, in high school, I was in plays, I was in bands. Um, I love performing and, um, it's the same to me. Wrestling, music, it's all performance. Gotcha. So, Bill, thank you uh, so much for all the time today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem, man. Anytime. Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and click the subscribe button to not miss any of our latest shoot interviews, match videos, or news updates. Follow us on Twitter at the Hannibal TV for instant updates.